Hello, welcome everyone to Narratives of Connection. It's our first podcast um, looking and exploring uh, the benefits of stories that show connection with people, at, mostly at probably at vulnerable times in their in their lives. Um, today, I have with me our first guest, uh, Professor Rod McLeod. So we are honoured to have you with us, Rod. Um, Thank you not only much. not only um, as our first guest, but just being with you to um, talk about connections and care and palliative care from that perspective um, with the breadth of experience that you have. So um, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, I thought when I left clinical practice that I would miss it terribly, but um, I've got enough things to keep me going that I don't miss it terribly. I, I do miss that daily interaction with vulnerable people, but um, I think I sleep better at night now that I'm not worrying about whether we've done the right thing or whether we've made a connection to improve the end of somebody's life. So it's I quite, heard, yeah. I have heard that from retired clinicians that the the worry of the care for other people um that being taken away from them in retirement is a relief i think that i think that's very true once you're when you're in the middle of it you don't necessarily think gosh i'm worried about betty or phil or bob but i think there is a sort of subliminal concern that you don't ever let that go. So you might go and, and spend time with somebody and make those connections and, and help them to formulate a plan. But I think at the back of your mind, there's always that little niggle, have I done absolutely the best that I can? Now, in the moment, you obviously do that. But on reflection, you sometimes, I used to sometimes think, I wonder if I could have done that better. And I think I think that's an important lesson that that the importance of reflection is paramount uh, when you're providing care for somebody who's in a vulnerable position. So that you, you do take a moment to think, what have I done that's been good? What what could I do that might be better? And what will I take from that encounter into the next one and the one after that? Because Alfred Lord Tennyson, I think it was, that said, we are but a collection of memories. And I think over those 30 years plus, I've probably cared for about 15,000 people and their families. And those memories of most of them if I dig deep, there's something memorable about every one of them. So it's a real privilege to have done that. And the care is different as well in terms of, I mean, there's different kinds of care. There's that hands-on care. There's the, the planning of care. And yeah. just in terms of the reflection of what you have done and what you haven't done and what you could do better in the future and what you take to other um consultations is the idea of us working in an imperfect system where we know that the planning of care is important to avoid certain uh, pitfalls that are that are in the system inherently and that we haven't had the power to change over time so the planning of care is another aspect of making sure that that path that the person is on is as smooth as possible to wherever they need to get to that's a really important point, Leroy, because when I when I think back to the time that I spent, particularly in a big teaching hospital in Sydney, one of the things that I used to annoy the junior staff with on the wards was I would go and see, they would ask me to go and see somebody, and I would say to them, well, what's the plan of care here? And they'd quite often look and think, oh, well, I'm not sure that we know. I think because... In a busy teaching hospital, what tends to happen is that 
things just get done because they can be done. And taking the opportunity to sit back and think, well, what is it that we're aiming for here? Are we aiming for something which is actually futile? Are we aiming for something that this person really wants for themselves? Are we being guided too strongly by the family? Or is this just a medical exercise whereby we do all the tests and we find out what could be done and therefore we do it? So I think going back to the very basics and making sure that, that medical students and nursing students and, and everybody who's learning about healthcare has the opportunity to think, well, who does plan the care? Who, whose care plan is this? And, and sometimes looking in health records, you see a care plan and it's been written by maybe the nursing staff with a bit of help added on from the medical staff, but you wonder whether or not the person whose care plan it is has been involved. And so probably the most important question to ask somebody when you meet them is, you know, what do you want me to do? What, what does my care involve with you? And do you think we've got better at doing that over the years? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll turn that back on myself. I think I've got better at it. Yeah. And I think I've tried very hard to teach about it. But yeah. the fact that you can still go onto a ward in a, in a busy teaching hospital and find somebody that doesn't have a, a clear plan of care which they own the patient owns suggests that we've still got quite a lot of work to do now that's not to say that we aren't better now at person-centered care because i think there's been so much written in the medical literature and in the lay press about doctors doing things to people rather than with them that i think more doctors particularly are aware of the fact that they need to be in a partnership. Um, but I, I, I do think, yes, yeah, so from that perspective, we're better than we were when I was a medical student, which actually wouldn't be hard. Um, but I do think we've got a long way to go. And so this brings us to a question that you asked me many years ago, and for just in terms of reference for the the audience, um, Rod, uh, was um, my boss uh, in Auckland when I moved to Auckland and has been a, a, a friend and mentor and still a boss, yes, uh, going on now. But uh, one of the first questions I was asked was, you know, um, you know, can we teach people to care? Mm. So um, I know it's been a long and illustrious career of trying to do that over the years um and I, I think you're right we have we have improved but that question still remains in terms of um can we do that and and, and have we how far have we got with that yeah well one of the high spots for me in working in australia was the university of sydney asked me to do a lecture series not just one but a series of four on the nature of care and uh you know when when i was initially asked you could have knocked me down with a feather because this was something quite new and yeah sure not all the medical students turned up but those that did were really interested because their perception when they started their training was that this is what they were going to medicine to do was to learn how to care but if you look at the medical curriculum in most universities, there's an awful lot of technical detail. There's an awful lot of um, um, biochemical detail. There's pharmacological detail and, and uh, operative detail, if you like, but very little about the art of medicine. And so over my time as an academic, one of the things that I've tried to do is to teach people about 
uh, compassion and empathy and therefore some of the elements of what a caring clinician should look like. Now, I've done it in various ways. Initially, I did it by um, reading poetry to them or playing music to them or showing them artworks and asking them to try and identify what was in the mind of the poet or the painter or the composer. In that way, they can then extrapolate that, if you like, to trying to work out what might be in the mind of the person who they're tasked with the care of. And inevitably, what that comes down to is the ability to create a human connection. Now, a lot of people, when you're a professor of a medical specialty and you walk into a room, people expect you to have a stethoscope around your neck and, and to stand there and, and pontificate. What you really need to do is to leave all the accoutrements of your profession behind and, and create a situation where they see you as another human being, first and foremost. Yes, you've got medical skills and knowledge and, and all of that sort of thing, but if they can see you as a human being and you can have a human contact, then that goes some of the way to creating a connection which will enable you to build into that the, the medical knowledge or wisdom that you, you've gained in order to help them. I remember when I was in Dunedin, there was a retired physician who gave a very popular lecture, and I can't remember the title of it, but it was something related to Sherlock Holmes. And his premise was that when you went into a patient's room or by their bedside, you needed to be something of a detective to work out something about them. What sort of flowers did they have? What sort of book were they reading? Uh, were the people around? All those sort of things. Yeah. And, and I can remember right back to my very early days, actually with a surgeon, surprisingly, who made that human connection through talking about the flowers that were on the bedside locker. And that was the first thing he ever spoke about. He was a keen gardener. But what it did was it put the patients at their ease because he was a human being first and a surgeon second. Yeah. And I think if we can find some common ground um, as human beings, then it's easier to build that relationship. I think so often in medicine, we feel that we have to have these layers of protection um, and I can remember um, realizing quite early on that the best way for me to create connections with people was to remove the protection whenever I could. Now, you, you can't always do that because you may not be feeling up to it or you, you might be rushed or whatever, but wherever you can, if you can remove those um layers of protection and sit down and hold their hand and look them in the eye and let them know that you're not frightened, then that goes a long way to creating that initial connection, which you can then build on. Yeah. I remember once asking some patients when I was doing my own PhD, which was around the nature of medical care and how we could teach it. What was different between us as palliative medicine specialists and the other doctors in the hospital. And the common response there was, well, you're not afraid. And I think that's, that's really very telling because what it meant was that we, we were able to engage. We didn't look away. We didn't find a reason not to engage or, you know, we didn't write in the notes or look at the computer. Yeah. We were completely upfront with them. Yeah. And there's an, <clears throat> there's an element of an expectation that you know palliative care 
clinicians can make a connection much more rapidly than other clinicians. There's a kind of um, a quick gaining of trust. Even the referral is sort of coming later. We can still generate uh, that trust and connection in most cases more readily than other clinicians. Now that may, that's probably part of it in that we we see people from a human perspective first and then add on the advice that we can give from our discipline and profession to help support them or... I think, I think the other thing, well, the, the training of palliative medicine is essentially for the management of people. And, and so we do look at that physical, psychological, social, spiritual, political, sexual, all of that, those different dimensions of a person. So much of medicine seems to be about the management of disease, but palliative medicine is about the management of people who happen to have a disease. In, in many cases, it doesn't really matter what the disease is because the aspects that we're focusing on managing aren't just the physical attributes of a malignant disorder or a, a process of dementia. What we're looking at is how how is this person within the context of their family coping with this illness? And I think one of the things that we teach the medical students is that palliative medicine particularly is about managing people in the context of their family Yes, they've got a disease, but so many times it doesn't really matter what that disease is because we're managing all those different dimensions of the person, not just making sure that their potassium's corrected or their bowels are moving or, or whatever it is. And that seems fundamental to medicine in general, maybe even from our, maybe that's probably because of our perspective, but yeah. it, it may also be that from a medical perspective, we're only wanting to manage what we can control. Yes. <laughs> because the other elements are potentially societal, you know, community, personal, family dynamics, relationships, and they're kind of beyond the remit of medicine to um, deal with, but perhaps can inform and support in a better way. Well, uh, yeah, that's a very good point, because I wonder if the reason that palliative medicine isn't sometimes taken as seriously as other more interventional specialties is because people don't actually see the work that we do. I remember writing in a paper once that, you know, you can be paid hundreds or thousands of dollars for a technical procedure but um, people don't value the time spent sitting at a bedside, listening to somebody's story and working out how to help them. It's, it's a complete mismatch. Uh, we do have specialist skills which take years to hone, just in the same way that a cardiac surgeon has specialist skills or a gastroenterologist has specialist skills. But for some reason, the skills of palliative medicine aren't uh, given the same value as the skills of some of those other specialties. Yeah. And that's why around the world, uh, palliative care has got to essentially be charitably funded. You know, Australia leads the world, I think, in its funding of palliative care, but um, there are still large areas of the world where Charity is what supports the care of people approaching the end of life. Yeah, yeah. So just think, I mean, Diane Meyer talked about the, the communication uh, is a, an important skill that we have uh, and is um, underestimated. Just like you would teach someone to put a central line in, we should be teaching communication skills um, and it should be valued in the same way. Yeah. And you could argue probably more because there's more communication than central lines going into people. Yes. Um, so, I mean, and then that's a, that's a big part of how we create connection is obviously our communication as well. So can you reflect on some connections with patients that you've had 
or it could even be with colleagues uh, over the, over the course of your career and what you think made that connection um, more important than other connections well i I have gone back time and time again to tell people the story of Roy and Millie so when I was a relatively junior uh, GP in rural England. I had a patient called Roy who had been married to Millie for 40 years. They lived together and worked together. They had a post office. And Roy got lung cancer. And I thought in my naivety that he was going to die in the next week or two. And I said to him, well, I'll come and visit you. Um, I did a lot of home visiting in those days. And so I, I went to visit him and after the first couple of visits he said to me it's very good of you to come rod um but you don't actually have to change my medicines every time you come we could just sit and talk um and that was a big kind of aha moment for me that here was this person teaching me how i might do my job better and over the following weeks i would go maybe a couple of times a week and see how Roy was getting on and watch how Millie was caring for him. And um, I have to admit that I, I missed a number of uh, medical events that often accompany lung cancer. I was slow on the uptake. But um, when, when Roy died, um, I was away, actually, I was away from the practice. And um, they'd phoned one of my GP partners and, and he said, oh, well, uh, Millie said, you know, Roy's not well. And he said, well, he, he's going to have to go to hospital. And she said, well, I don't want him to go to hospital because we'd always planned with Rod that he would stay home for the end of his life. Yeah. And this guy said, well, I, I, you know, you can't, you can't do it. I'll, I'll admit him to hospital. And so an ambulance came and took him into the local hospital where Roy died 12 hours later. And Millie was distraught when I came back on the Monday morning. She was just beside herself because this is not what their plan had been. And it had been completely railroaded. And in fact, Millie eventually died of a broken heart. She developed an arrhythmia and, and died within six months. And that was the trigger for me. Firstly, that they taught me what my role in end of life care could be, which was different to perhaps the end of life role that I had anticipated. And secondly, that when they make a plan, we should do everything that we can to stick to that plan. Mm. And so after that time, that was when I started devising my own training scheme because there was no training for palliative medicine in those far away years. And I, and I went to work in a number of different hospices and learned. And so I have so much to thank Roy and Millie for and their boxer dog. Uh, I can picture them now. It, they gave me such a gift and, and I've carried that with me um, for over 30 years. Yeah. So that was... That was in, important, yeah. It's quite insightful on Roy's part to see what you were actually doing when, yeah. and potentially, I mean, you talked about the the fear, the lack of fear that we tend to have, but maybe there was a fear there, and like you said, there were no training programs for yeah. palliative care I, at that point. I really didn't know what I was doing. You know, I I was going to see him because I thought that's what you should do, yeah, but. I learned, I learned from them both. I learned about the nature of care by watching Millie closely and listening to Roy. Um, and sadly, the ending wasn't what they'd anticipated, but it triggered off this career that I've enjoyed so much for over 30 years. Yeah. And when you were actually then talking with after he kind of pointed out you don't need to change the drugs and you did have conversations with him 
how did, what were the what were those conversations what were the connections there were they about specific topics or was it more generally kind of philosophical yeah well i think it was pro- probably more philosophical because we talked about his hopes and his fears and i mean he had a wonderful sense of humor i remember his son bought him a very expensive cashmere jumper which which he was wearing one time when I went to see them, he was having his breakfast and, and he spilled marmalade all down the front of it. And I said, Oh, right. That's terrible. He said, no, it's not. I don't care. I'm going to be dead in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> yeah. You know, he was that kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Perspective and sense of humor often helped yeah. the situation. Yeah. And I think he was prepared because we had conversations about what his dying was going to be like, we thought. And sadly, the plan went awry because my GP partner didn't buy into it, just bossed yeah. them around. Right. And I've seen that so many times, you know, doctors overriding family patient wishes. Yeah. Adopting a model of care that they'd been taught rather than... Hmm. listening to the model of care that potentially yeah rather than adapting yeah yeah adapting the model of care yeah that's true yeah so what about some examples of people where the connection wasn't so great well one i remember how, with a, how did you feel about that in terms of well, i can i can tell you because it's imprinted heavily in my brain <laughs> it was a guy that i looked after when i was in wellington he was a, the skipper of a fishing boat. And I can't remember his disease. It probably doesn't matter. But he had very complex pain. And I was trying very hard to adjust his medication, to listen to him, uh, his fears and his anxieties about his pain. And I would go and see him in the ward. And... This one time I went, I said, probably been looking after him for about 10 days. And one time I went and I said, no, I'm really sorry. We haven't been managed. We haven't managed to get your pain under control, but we're really doing our best. And he just looked me straight in the eye and he said, well, Rod, looks to me like your best isn't good enough. And I was absolutely floored. I was devastated. I had to leave the room because I could feel the tears welling up because he was right, actually. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't been able to, to remove the pain, which is what he wanted. Um, and, and he was right. And, and he had, our relationship wasn't good enough really for him to say, don't worry, Rod, it's okay. I'm sure you'll get it in the end. Yeah. Uh, he was just, so fed up that our best, what I'd said was our best, wasn't good enough. Mm. We did eventually get his pain managed. And after that, I had a good relationship with him. But that moment where he just eyeballed me and said, well, your, your best isn't good enough. I mm. was devastated because we don't often hear that from the people that we're caring for. Yeah. And there's, there's a kind of difference of agenda, isn't there? Because often we're trying to understand people as people and how their lives are affecting this moment and how they're coping and what's important to them. But, you know, their agenda may be get my pain under control. Yeah. And then we can start talking about that sort of stuff. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which sounds like what <clears throat> happened when you eventually did have a better relationship with him. Yeah. I think some of the work that, that I did with my colleague, Anna Jansen, when we were trying to identify the nature of care from the viewpoint of, of um, the patients and then what we needed to do to teach the medical students about it, revolved around three hours. The first thing was recognition. So recognition of the fact that there is a caring relationship here or not. Um, the second thing was reflection and 
And in both of those cases, I had ample opportunity to reflect. And in fact, that's been incorporated into my practice now for many, many years that I take the opportunity to reflect on whether there has been a connection made and if so, what, what brought it about and how might we build on that. And then the third R uh, for the medical students is role modeling. And it's quite often role modeling from the patient. The patients lead the way in this. And if we can understand what their agenda is and demonstrate that we can be a role model for those that we teach, it's those three things which I, I truly believe are probably the most important. The three hours of recognition, reflection and role modeling will enable us to do the best that we can in creating connections and providing the best care possible. Mm. Sounds like an optimal kind of, uh, what, three R's that we should be teaching more regularly yeah. in clinical practice. Well, it wouldn't be a bad idea, Leroy, yeah. <laughs> But people don't tend to take a lot of notice of what I say. <laughs> but there's the other there's the other element of the work that you did with Anna, which was this this sort of symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Um, so we create connections, and they work both ways. And there's yeah. no difference with patients and families that we meet, where they are as concerned sometimes about us as we are about them. Yeah, and and I, I remember laughing about. I don't know much about um, transactional analysis, but I quite like the idea of that adult parent child thing. Yeah. And an awful lot of times when, when we're providing healthcare, ideally it's adult to adult, but quite often it's parent to child, yeah. especially when people are vulnerable and weak. Um, and I've witnessed that with colleagues too many times. But what happens is that when they get better, these sick, weak people, they flip the, the they flip it over and they become the parent and they start saying to the doctor, Oh, you're looking a bit tired today, doctor. Do you think you should have an early night or maybe mm. get off home? And so there is that element of, of them caring for us, which is what you would expect if you had a normal human interaction it is uh, reciprocal yeah so reciprocity is the fourth r <laughs> so we created a four r model for us to teach or five if you count rod rod says <laughs> rod's four r's um <laughs> yeah that might be a, a good way to sell it yeah we'd have to have we have to put anna in there though yeah. yes that's true that's true um so what about in terms of, so that would be a good way for us to sort of think about um, as we talk to other clinicians or talk to other, um, yeah, other clinicians about how to build, build trust, build empathic relationships, build that connection in, in terms of those four R's. Are there any others that you can think of? Well, the approaches that would, would, would that help i think i think it was um harvey chotinoff who brought attention to a question which you and i have probably been asking for many years and that is what do you need me to know about you which will help me to care for you better and i think that's a it, it can be an enormous question, you know, but essentially what it's saying is I need to understand who you are, not what you've got, but who you are in order to provide the best care possible. So an allied to that is the question, what matters most to you? And it may well, and if you ask those questions, you quite often find that it's, nothing to do with the disease what matters most to them is that they 
grandchildren will come to see them or that they'll feel the sun on their back or yeah. or, or smell a rose or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but but realising um, that people are resilient in the face of seemingly impossible odds as long as they can achieve the things that they want to achieve. Yeah. When I was working in England, <clears throat> I used to get asked to go to quite a grand institution called the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases. So this was a quaternary referral centre for people with horrible uh, joint diseases. And so I knew when a referral from there came, my heart would sink because yeah. they'd already been through three or four lots of clinicians trying to manage their pain. And I can remember going to see one woman who was sitting up in bed. And when I was sitting with her, you could actually hear joints moving. She was, she was in pain all of the time. And I can remember saying to her, um, what, what, what is it that keeps you going? And I could see that she was just looking over my shoulder. Oh, this is a bit odd. She's supposed to be looking at me. I'm <laughs> having a conversation. But she said, that. And I turned around and here was her granddaughter bringing her some roses. Yeah. And th those were the most important things to her. The fact that so many people had tried and failed to manage her pain. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was nasty for her, but her day lit up when the things that mattered most to her appeared. Yeah. And so what we were able to do was to engineer a situation where her granddaughter could visit her more frequently and that she could have flowers, which she loved. And her pain did reduce because it wasn't entirely due to, the pain wasn't entirely due to her joint disease. Mm. There were other existential reasons for her distress. Um, so that was an important lesson too, that you always need to find out what matters most uh, because you might be barking up the wrong tree. And often I think we are barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. yeah. So um, getting to know the person and that question that, that Harvey highlighted what what is it that you need me to know about you which will help me to care for you better yeah and there was another r in there actually in resiliency um, yes. which yeah. is not only not only the person's resilience to what they are facing but also i suppose our our resilience in terms of um dealing with the work that we do in a system that's broken and advocating for people who are vulnerable in that context. I mean, there's there's a whole there's a whole amount of resiliency that we need. We also get that, you know, drive from the the people that we see who are yeah. more vulnerable, who teach us that we we are trying to advocate for them. We are trying to be resilient to whatever else go, else is going on to to advocate for them. I think the difficulty is if you aren't resilient and you have been beaten down by the system, if you like. Uh, then other people's distress weighs a lot more heavily on you. And it's, it's harder to go into those consultations, those discussions, create those connections without your defence. So if your resilience is low, then the, the barriers come up. Yeah. I, early on, when I was working in a hospital, there used to be a surgeon there who was a blunt northerner and he was so blunt that you just think how, how on earth he was a good surgeon but <clears throat> i can remember him going to a young guy on a post-operative ward round and he he was standing at the end of the bed and he grabbed his foot and he said hey lad you're an interesting one you remember that cancer that steve mcqueen had that killed him well, you've got it. And then he just walked on. Mm. And 
I thought, this is terrible, you know, something's going to happen here. But after a couple of weeks of that, he would refer me a lot of people to go and see. And then he started writing at the bottom of the referral letter, Rod, we're so pleased that you've now joined the hospital because I really don't know how to cope with this. Mm. And we're grateful for you coming to see these people. Now, he was honest enough to say, actually, I don't know how to cope with this. Yeah. But he got round that. His, his bluster, E-Lab, you've got that nasty cancer, was his way of defending himself because he didn't know how to cope with it. Yeah. So I think when we see some of our colleagues uh, behaving in a way that you might think is suboptimal, you have to question, well, why are they like that? What, what has happened that's made them so fearful of human connection? Mm. And well, have you seen, I mean, I think many of us, I'm sure you've got the same experience where we've had a real um, barrier to palliative care in an organization. Uh, and it's one person who's kind of really um, creating that barrier. And then suddenly they have an experience or over time we've shared patients or we've made a connection in some way in, in a different environment. And then suddenly the barriers fall away as yeah. that create, as that connection has been uh, amplified. So have you got, you know, that's one, that's one story of, of uh, someone who obviously was vulnerable, vulnerable enough to say that they didn't know how to deal with this. And thank goodness you were around. But yeah. there, has there been someone who's put, putting barriers up that you've managed to well, it's not quite the same, but um, when I was working in Wellington, we looked after one of the government chauffeurs. So this was a chauffeur who drove around the Prime Minister or, or you know, the Minister of Health or whoever it was. And um, we, we did quite a good job, actually, of looking after this very nice man who knew lots and lots of politicians. And a few of them came to visit. And lo and behold, after that, the, the parliamentarians started doing their own fundraising for the, for the hospice. Because there we were, working away, if you like, without them realising it. And then here was somebody that they respected, their chauffeur, who'd looked after them for years and years. And they thought, oh, well, maybe there's something we can give back here. So yeah. that was that was a really uh, pivotal moment for those parliamentarians to realise. I mean, they, why they couldn't just up the, the ante from the Ministry of Health, I don't know, but they did their own fundraising to support the hospice, which I thought was fantastic. I, I don't think it's still going on, but just... I often tell trainees that you're really only as good as the last person you looked after um, because you, you very often don't get a second chance at it. And so you have to, as much as you possibly can, you have to be on your top game every single time. Yeah. Because if you're not, that may be one which gives fuel to the people who want to put up the barriers. But if you are on top of your game and you can come up with the goods time after time, then that breaks down those barriers in, in institutions where people are reluctant. Yeah, that's very so true. You, you do your best absolutely every single time. And the last person you saw is really you've create you've you've got all that experience you've picked up all these skills over the years you should be able to do your best at that point as yeah. a matter of your own personal um ability to do that but also leading the way and demonstrating how how that interaction or that consultation should go really yeah i mean the 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 danger is 
that's a lot of pressure now when I think about it. But I think it's a very, it's a very good point that we do have a responsibility to ourselves and to yeah. the person and to other people around us to demonstrate what the skills we have have gained. Uh, well, that's the that's the hour of role modeling. Yeah. So that when you're taking students to the bedside, you <clears throat> you behave in a way. Well, I, I tell them, you know, you behave in a way that you would like to be treated yourself or your spouse or your partner would like to be treated. Um, you, you can't make judgments. You can't, you know, make fun of people for their, if they're smelly or dirty or whatever. Um, and, and uh, uh, sadly, there's, I think there's been quite a lot of that in, in health that it shouldn't matter what you look like, what you sound like what you smell like, what your disease is. You should yeah. be able to overcome that and treat everybody as if this was the person that you're going to be judged on. Yeah. You can see that in some team meetings where yeah. some somebody's found out that this person ran in the Olympics and got a silver medal, um, you know, in the 100 metres and in, you know, whichever year it was. Um, and so now, so now everyone's connected. Everyone's suddenly interested in this person. But why aren't why are they more interesting than the person in the next bed? Exactly. Why, why are we not highlighting something about them that is of interest to make a connection with them as well? And yeah. We um, often over the years. And and it's to do with it's going back to that. What do I need to know about you in order to care for you better? It doesn't matter that they won a silver medal at the Olympics. Uh, I, I can remember um, seeing somebody who had won or was up for a very prestigious prize here in New Zealand. And this person came into the clinic and I, and I said, oh, it's, uh, I read today that you're up for this very prestigious prize. And this person said to me, I haven't come here to talk about that. <laughs> I've come here because I've got lymphoma. Yeah. And that was a real, you know, that, that didn't matter yeah. to that person. Um, so treating everybody as you would want to be treated yourself. I think finding out who the person is. You know, yeah. People say, oh, you know, I haven't achieved anything in my life. Everybody's achieved something, yeah. every single person. Yeah. And if you take the trouble to listen, you can find that out. Yeah. Well, just just thinking about that, you know, the politicians, um, um, and there's an element of us not really making a connection with end of life in general as a, as a society, so that when there is that, experience that connects us more to the end of life suddenly there's a window into what's important potentially that we should be thinking about and then they can advocate for you know whatever they want to or to try and support what's what's needed at that point in time um and maybe that's where i think over the course of your career you've created an opportunity for people to have more connections with end of life and to see it in different perspectives in that in that we can start to do more work to better support people in that vulnerable time um, but also to support the clinicians who are involved in that care and also the the carers um, you know in order to support them to provide the care and, and to and to help um, at that at that period of time so it's a it's a Difficult, difficult thing. Society's taboo, isn't it? We, we, there's a it, taboo. It's thing. really very challenging. <clears throat> I was saddened today to read there's a woman in Britain who who has championed the cause of people with bowel cancer. She was made a dame in the New Year's Honours. She's a young woman. She goes by the name of Bowel Babe. And she she has done podcasts and talked on the BBC about her illness, so raising awareness for bowel cancer, but also, really importantly, letting all the people who are interested in her, because she's a very attractive, personable woman, 
who said, I'm not having any more treatment, I'm dying. And so then the conversation moved from bowel cancer to the fact that this beautiful young woman with two kids was dying. Yeah. And she raised colossal amounts of money, as well as a huge interest from the public in not only bowel cancer, but the fact that she was dying. Um, and she died today. Well, people like that are extraordinary. I mean, she, she managed to find a vehicle, a voice to educate millions of people. Yes, the money is really important because it'll go for research. But I think if we can help people to find their voice to, even if it's only within their family, to help people to be less fearful of what is in store for them, then, then we'll have done a great service. So having, going back to that, we're not afraid. We're not afraid of death. We're not afraid of people dying. It's, it's what we do. We have to examine ourselves and make sure that we don't have serious hangups because if we do, you can be sure that the person that we're caring for will find them out. Yeah. 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 Uh, so in that reciprocity, we need to really have a bit of self-reflection <clears throat> so that we can be sure that we're doing the best that we can and that we understand who we are in yeah. order to create that connection. Yeah. Well, Rod, that's probably a great point for us to wrap up um, on a high note um, and also sort of set the bar for us to continue to work towards. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this um, and sharing your wisdom with us. And we'll get those R's together and yeah. publicize it. Um, a little bit more broadly so we can get that out to the world. Well, it's always a pleasure, Leroy. Thank you so much for doing this. I think it's really important uh, and I look forward to hearing what comes next. So thank you. Take care. Thanks, Thanks a lot sir. and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Okay. Bye.